Hey guys, JB here from Alpha Wolf Consulting and welcome to an introduction to sales by Alpha Wolf Consulting. This is a course that I have developed um, that basically gives you a, a great understanding of how to sell, what is sales, okay, understanding communication at the highest level, and basically understanding all the different forms of sales. So, you know, when we're trying to understand, well, what is sales? Sales is just simply directed communication. So communication where we have a directed end goal. So we start a conversation with a customer or a customer inquires about having a problem that they need solved or a pain that they are in. And we take them through a guided process to getting them the result that they want, the end result. And in a nutshell, this is sales. Sales is about achieving goals for your customer. Now, those goals could be anything from a customer wanting to buy a pizza, a customer wanting to, you know, lose weight, a customer, like it's all these different things, whatever you know, industry you're in, whatever niche you're in, whatever, you know, product or service that you sell will determine the customers and the audience that you speak to and the different goals, needs, objectives that they may hold. So it's important to understand that, you know, the goal of sales is to communicate at the highest level. So what do we mean by communicating at the highest level? What we want to ask questions that give us information that allow us to understand our buyers or our, you know, our customers at the highest level. So if we're selling, for example, you know, marketing services to small businesses, what we want to know who are the ideal small businesses? Who, you know, what are their common problems? You know, what are the common, you know, challenges external to them that they may face either individually to them or industry-wide, okay, or, or specific to the industry that they're in? Then we also want to understand, well, what are some of the opportunities that, face them or that they have the ability to achieve or that are industry specific, okay? So if we're doing marketing for small businesses, if we're working with, for example, you know, let's say we're working with a chip company, a company that manufactures chips, there's going to be many obstacles and many challenges that are working, you know, against and for these businesses, so things like understanding, well, where is the right place to put the product, okay? How do we build the brand of the business up? How do we create the messages, you know, for the for the business? Like, like what is it about this manufacturer, about this business that we're helping that really sets it apart from not only its competitors, but also allow its ideal customers to feel connected with it. So what we're going to go through in this course is just a bit of an understanding, well, what is sales? Okay, a bit of a brief history of my experience in sales, just from what I noticed over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, we go through my thesis on sales um, so these are just my personal theses that I have developed over many years working within sales. All right, I go through what I've found in my experience or throughout my experience in sales. So just through personal experiences that I've gone through and different ways that I was able to achieve the goals that I wanted. Okay, the three keys of any sales. To understand this is just to understand a buyer must know you, a buyer must like you, and a buyer must trust you before they purchase anything from you. So if they know who you are, they like who you are, and they trust who you are, they're going to buy from you 90% of the time. Because these are the metrics that customers use, and you can look at it in your own life. If you don't trust someone, 
you're not likely to buy from them. If you don't like someone, why would you invest your money in that person? If you don't know someone and Joe Blow down the street walks up to you and says, I've got three magic beans that'll get, you know, give you a beanstalk to the fucking sky. Like, you know, if we don't know someone, if we don't trust someone, if we don't like someone, these are heavily influencing the the decision making that we go through in life. Okay, so the four four step process of a sale. Now, what does this entail? Well, first we have to qualify our buyers to understand if they are our buyers and if our product or service can help them. Then we have to understand presenting. We have to present our offer to our potential buyer. We have to present, you know, the offer. We have to present, you know, the features, the benefits. We have to pre present some of the objections that may come up. We have to present, you know, some of the negative aspects to prepare that customer. But most importantly, we have to build a reputation with our customer. That's why it's called presenting because we're presenting information. We're educating buyers, but we're also a presenter. So to understand this is just to understand when we present things, we are not being disputed. So this isn't a conversation. It's a presentation. So we want to capture when presenting the buyer's attention and then we want to take them on a journey to understanding what they need to understand to get the benefits and and you know the good stuff from the product or service that we offer we have to overcome objections so you know the third step of this process to sales is overcoming objections now, why do we have to overcome objections? Because no one wants to be a laid down sale, okay? Everyone wants to be sold or wants to, you know, have that feeling of making a good decision towards their future, but people don't want to be sold by the words that you say, by a charlatan. So we just got to understand throughout history, okay, our, in our history, there have always been Charlemagne, Charlemagne's, you know, snake oil salesmen, car salesmen, you know, dodgy people that lie, manipulate pressure and use negativity to get ahead in life. Okay. These are the people that we fight. These are the reasons that there are objections. If there wasn't these people in the world, we wouldn't have to worry about it. But unfortunately, there is. So understanding objections, objections aren't real. If you come to me and you say, I want to lose weight, and I say, this gym program will, will get you to where you want. This dietary plan will get you to where you want. This protein and supplements are going to be what are going to get you to where you want. And you say to me, I don't think that will work. Well, it's not my point to convince you. I know it works. You don't think it works. Do you sort of see objections aren't real? The objections people have, for example, if we are a marketing business to small business and they're objecting to the price of our service, do you not want free money? Do you not want this and that? Like to understand this is just to understand that if I believe a thousand percent that what I am giving you is a hundred dollar bill and I am asking for a dollar and you object to that. I don't need to convince you that a hundred dollars is more valuable than a dollar. Do you, do you understand? But if I don't believe that this hundred dollar bill is a hundred dollar bill and I think it's just a piece of paper and I ask you for a dollar for this hundred dollar bill and you object to me and then I say, but it is. Look, it's got the water markings. It's got the holographics. It's got this. It's got that. Do you see? Knowing the value of your product or service, understanding the value of who you are, who your company is, who your business is, is how you overcome objections because objections aren't real. 
all right? And then we close the sale. How do you close the sale? You ask for the order. If you don't ask for the order, so you don't say, Jim, would you like to buy this weight loss program? You will never know. So asking for the order is the important thing. And when we're closing a sale, it's just the end step. So if we have qualified that they want and need our product, if we have presented the value of our product, the features and benefits that they're going to get, if we have you know, overcome the objections of them saying, well, I don't believe that's a $100 bill, so I'm not going to give you a dollar. And we say, okay, I'll give this $100 bill to the next guy. See ya. Okay. So if we're able to overcome the objections, their objection isn't to the product or service. It's to the person that they're dealing with because they don't know who you are. They don't know, like, and trust you. Because if they know, like, and trust you, they treat you with honesty. If they don't know, like, and trust you, it's all lies. So you got to understand if you are not good at building a massive, massive amount of trust within seconds, if you do not have a reputation that goes back years, that is impervious. When a customer gives you an objection, they are lying to you. There is always truth in that objection, but that objection is not the truth. So when we understand this and we're able to overcome the objections, what happens is, is then we ask for the order. So it's sort of like with your friend. We decide that we want to go out for dinner tonight. I want to go to one place, you want to go to the other place. I tell you why this place is good. So I qualify you. Are you hungry? Yeah. Do you want to go out for dinner? Yeah. Great. Now I present my option. We go into a steakhouse. You say, no, I don't want to go to a steakhouse. I want to go to an Italian restaurant. And then we talk back and forth about different things on the menu that we want, things we want to achieve within this meal. I would like to have steak and veg. You say, I would like to have pasta. So we look at the different options, the different restaurants, the different menus, okay? And then we make a, a decision based on that. Now, I'm going to still want what I want, and you're going to want what you want. So you're going to object to what I want so that you can get what you want. But maybe you don't know what I know about this restaurant. Maybe you don't know what I know about that restaurant. Regardless, when we're overcoming objections, it's not our job to prove to someone why it's important. I don't need to justify to you why I, I think this steakhouse is good. Because at the end of the day, I can just say, you go to the Italian restaurant, I'm going to the steakhouse, see ya, and walk away. If you want to be around me, if you want to be with me, if you want what I want, you're going to come with me. If you don't, you'll go your own way. It doesn't matter. It's not do or die. It's not every customer is the customer. So that's an important thing to understand. When we're coming from qualifying to presenting, okay, we're trying to understand, are you a potential customer? When we come to the objections, we really get into it. This is how our customers act. This is the process that our customers go through to get the results they want. Okay, you've got objections. Your objections are baseless because typically they are. You could argue that they're not, but they generally are depending on the amount of energy and effort that a consumer has put into understanding the product or the service that they are looking for. If a customer has put in a thousand hours into understanding the exact phone that they want, why they want that phone, every objection is true. So when they say, I don't want this phone because the camera is not as good or the processor is not as good or the screen is not as good, it doesn't have the, the same resolution, whatever it may be, okay? 
If you know within yourself that you have put in a thousand hours to know exactly what you want, that is different. But typically when asking someone who is objecting about their objection, they don't really know anything. Oh, I don't want to invest in stocks because stocks, stocks are a scam. Someone told me that years ago. Stocks are a scam. Do you see? You don't understand why stocks are a scam. You may have a couple of points of reference or, or language patterns or narratives that you reinforce, but you don't actually know why and what you want. So your objection is irrelevant. You think stocks are a scam. That's great. They're not a scam. And we can say, well, you know, Warren Buffett's made X amount of money on his stock investments, this, that, and the other. But we aren't trying to convince them. We are trying to educate them. So just understand that when we're overcoming objections, we're just educating people. Because the only way we can influence someone's decision making is through new information. Because I didn't know this before, I have decided to change my you know, opinion or direction. And then we have closing. And closing is just asking for the order. So we say, would you like to do business with us? And they say, I don't know, let me think about it. Great. What do you need to think about? Like you said this, this, and this. You said you want this result. I've shown you that it gets it. Why is that a problem? Why are we not going further? So just understand that, that we're using this four-step process back and forth. We ask for the order. They say no in some form of a way with an objection. Okay. We ask questions. We qualify. But you said you wanted X result. I showed you that this product gets X result. And now you're telling me you don't want this product. That's strange. Why would that be? And we keep pressuring. And it's not negative pressure, but it's positive pressure because we are forcing them to either stick to their position and then they cease to be a customer or we are forcing them to accept new information. And we're not talking about physical force. We're not talking about you have to believe me because of this, this, and this. No, it's that. I am challenging you with force saying, you said you wanted to lose weight, yet you do not want the gym membership. Why is that? You said you wanted to be healthier, but you do not want a diet plan. Why is that? Because you're saying you want this stuff. You're saying you want these results, but you don't want to do the work to get them. What's happening there? And we pressure them. Because it's very confronting to be called out as being full of shit. So that's what we're trying to do in a non-confrontational way. Okay, and that's the key to the four-step process is that when we ask for the order and we get an objection, we go back to qualify. And then we represent the information. And then we ask for the order again. And then we get a new objection. And we go back and we re-qualify. And then we represent. And then we ask for the order again. And either one or two things is going to happen. The customer is going to realize that they're full of shit or we're going to walk away. Like, that's that. Like, it's not, it's not about, you know, trying to convince them of why it's important, okay? We ask questions, okay? We qualify to know that, well, if you want to lose weight, a gym membership is probably the best. If you want to be healthier, a diet plan is probably the best. If you want to be, you know, at a high physical performance, well, then you probably want supplements and different things like that. Like, it's it's just logical. So we're just trying to help them understand and, and line the dots up. And that's the goal of sales. 
is we're doing directed communication that helps them line up the dots. Now, when we're going through this process of going from one dot to the other, the customer doesn't understand or see the full picture. But we've been in this a long time. We've been doing this a long time. The customer may not understand the picture. That is why we're there to guide them. You want to lose weight? I probably would avoid fast food. I'd probably get a gym membership. I'd probably get a dietary plan. And we nudge them towards that. And they can say, but I think I can do it on Macca's. Great, you're not a buyer for me. See you later. Don't waste your time. So just understand that. It's, to be a professional salesperson, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time on people that are irrelevant. If they don't want your product or service, they are not a buyer, okay? Regardless, regardless of what they may say, what you may think, this, that, and the other. People either want your product or service or they don't. It's not your job to convince them because unfortunately, people that are highly insecure and people with low self-esteem are the ones in society that try and convince other people of their worth. So to convince someone that you are someone of value, you cease to be valuable. All right. And then what we go through is prospecting for new business. So understanding the difference between prospecting, okay, and lead generation. So prospecting for new business is all about the outreach how we initiate conversations that then become, you know, late. So how do we take a name, you know, a name and a number and turn that into a paying customer? Well, first we need to prospect. So this is just either through cold or warm outreach. So, so what is cold outreach? Cold outreach is just direct messaging, you know, uh, Cold calling, you know, door knocking, face-to-face -face sales, like just walking around talking to people. And what we're trying to do when we're prospecting is we're trying to build the brand reputation up and the brand recognition up so that when we make offers, people know who we are. They like us. They may not trust us yet, but they know and like us. So we're already halfway in the door. So prospecting is the initial stages of the sales process. So the goal to understand with prospecting is that prospecting is a mix between engagement and marketing. We're trying to interest people, okay? We're trying to find out at a very, very rudimental level you know, is this a product or service that interests you? Do you want to know more? And they and 90% of them will say no. And that's okay. Because that's the point of prospecting. Is that we're not trying to turn every no into a yes. We're trying to get rid of the no's and find all the yeses. And people will either, you know, be interested in our product or service. They'll want to, or they won't. So if I say to you, you know, would you like to lose weight? Do you feel like you need to lose weight? And you say to me, no, I feel fine. I'm great. Great. You're not a buyer for this product. If someone says, yeah, I think I could, or maybe I need to do a little bit more about my health. Maybe I need to do a little bit more about this and that. Okay, would you like to have a conversation about that? A further conversation to find out how this product or service will actually get you the results that you want or, or get you closer to where you want to be. So that's the difference is prospecting is just trying to get that conversation started. And it's, it's very, very light and very gentle of an approach where we're just trying to build people up so that they know and like us. We don't need them to trust us just yet because we're not asking them for anything. But by building the amount that someone knows and likes us, trust is going to be one that comes 
after. So it'll be a knock-on effect. Now, the difference between prospecting and lead generation is prospecting is about starting the conversation, about that, you know, opening that line of communication with a potential buyer. Now, lead generation is taking that conversation and generating it into someone of interest to either purchase our product or service or someone that is interested in achieving a certain result. Okay. So the, the main difference is more around, you know, prospecting is about brand building. Okay. Lead generation is about providing value. So we want to build our brand reputation and then provide massive value to a consumer or a customer, okay? And then they become a lead. Do you sort of understand? So it's, it's a bit of a dance between it because in the lead generation stage, well, this is where we are qualifying them to know, well, are you interested in this product or service? Do you want to know more about it? What are your current objectives? So usually in lead generation, okay, where or in prospecting, we're asking a few general questions to get a bit of a temperature for that person and sort of show them that, you know, I'm a reasonable person, you're a reasonable person. I'm someone well-liked, you're someone well-liked. We're trying to relate to them. And then as we come over to lead generation, well, it's like, I know you mentioned you wanted to have you know, to get a bit healthier, to lose a bit of weight. Well, I've actually got this dietary plan that I've done up for people that works, you know, for people like you, whoever you may be. Maybe they're a man and they want to build muscle. This is the dietary plan to build muscle. Maybe they're a woman and they want to lose fat. This is the dietary plan to lose fat. Like our lead generation is the value we need to provide to a consumer to get them interested to do business with us, to do further business with us. So it can be anything from, you know, the content that we produce, producing valuable content for people, creating lead magnets, you know, value propositions for them, value offers for them, you know, all these different things. So just to understand that is just, you know, prospecting we're talking about action to generate interest right whereas lead generation is the action of taking that initial interest and creating a directed conversation through it someone says yeah i would love to buy my first home oh that's great that's really good well, do you want to take the steps to actually do it and find out your borrowing capacity? Like that's the difference. When a customer wants to take the actions to find out, they're moving to a lead. When they're just generally like, yeah, it'd be an all right idea. One day I'll buy a house. I don't know. It's not really a present, you know, concern of mine or something that I want to solve. So just understanding the difference between that is important now there are many different forms of sales okay and there are many different aspects of sales there are cold sales there are hot sales you know there's face-to-face -face sales there's over the phone sales there's you know zoom or whatever it's called like online meeting sales there's email sales there's text sales so like there's all these different forms of sales which are just channels of communication. Different forms of sales equal different channels of communication. So the different ways that we interact and communicate with one another are the different ways we sell. Now, I've only gone through and put two of them in there. The two most relevant are face-to-face -face and phone sales. Now, an important thing to understand about face-to-face -face sales is face-to-face -face sales is one of the highest converting sales not in times in terms of time management, but in terms of we are able to relate and, and build trust at a much higher rate face-to-face -face than we are over the phone. 
because in face to face, you've got my facial expressions, you've got my body language, you've got my tonality. Like you're able to gather more information from a conversation face to face with me than you are to a phone conversation. Okay. So just understand in face to face sales, we're able to use facial expressions, we're able to use body language and tonality and language patterns to sort of communicate at the highest level. In phone sales, okay, we're only able to use our tonality and our language pattern. They can't see us. They don't know who we are, what we look like. So it's a little bit harder, but also it's less pressure. Face-to-face -face sales, you know, you've got someone in your personal space. You can always walk away, but they may follow you. Whereas in phone sales, like they're just going to hang up on you. Like it's less pressure because all I have to do is hang up on you. Now, you may call me back again and again and again, like amateur sales people do, but, you know, all I have to do is block your number. So just understand that phone sales is less pressure, just like if you're doing face-to-face -face sales in public opposed to at people's houses. So door knocking people's houses is completely different to talking to someone on the street. Okay, because when we're talking about door knocking at a house, now we're talking about my personal private area, the place I feel safe. So just understand, in the different areas where we do sales, there are different social cues or social or behavioral understandings that we need to have. Like, for example, when we're door knocking at someone's house, well, we wouldn't want to make someone feel pressured or intimidated or stressed within their own house. That's a very uncomfortable feeling, but it's never going to get you to where you want to be. Just to the same, you know, on the street, people are going to be less pressured or feel less pressured on the street or over the phone to conversations that we have in comparison to being at their home. So just understand the social areas or the environments that we're in will influence the difference in how our conversation or communication is perceived. Now, the three core elements of communication, as I've mentioned, facial expression, body language, okay? So our body language, our tonality, so the different tones that we can go to, okay? The different ways we speak, how we emphasize things or how we say things. Okay, so understanding the difference between the tonalities that we're using will convey different meaning and different measure. Now, understand this, the core elements of communication are all unconscious, okay? So we've got our body language. Now, understand the importance of body language. Our body language is a way that we subconsciously communicate to other people. So if I'm highly agitated and, and very aggressive in my movements and I'm very, very, you know, tight, I am contracted on, well, not contracted, but I'm very tense. You're going to pick up on the tension of my muscles or my body language or my posture. <laughs> and this is going to tell you different things about my mental state. So, so just understand when we're talking about communication and subconscious communication, these are just the different ways that we're able to interpret and read people's behavior, actions, and words to understand how we may um, best navigate a situation to avoid danger. If someone's highly agitated, and they're highly tense, and they've got a weapon, we probably want to avoid them. If someone is calm, if someone is, you know, limbo, loose, relaxed, and they don't have a weapon, well, then we don't need to avoid them. It's someone we could talk to.
So just understand this, but also understand when we lie, we have we tells, we have trades. We're with our body language. Okay, our body language gives our, our mental state or our, the intention of our mental state. If I'm thinking negative thoughts or I'm looking to do negative actions, my natural body language will move that way. That's sort of why you get gut feelings about people. It's because there are slight shifts and changes in their facial expression or in their body language when they're doing something deceptive or trying to deceive that sort of makes you feel a bit uncomfortable. And that's the point of it. So the next area is tonality. Now, an important aspect to understand about tonality is that tonality is one of the ways we convey, again, our mental state, but it's also a way that we can capture people's attention. Now, the reason for this is because a lot of our communication is non-verbal in the sense of it's not about the words we say, but it's about how we say those words. It's about how our position is. Are we someone that is looking around nervously? Are we tense, you know, with my vocal? Am I, you know, a bit afraid and uncomfortable? Am I, am I feeling, you know, self-conscious about myself? Am I in fear? Like, am I in distress? So just understand that our subconscious mind is where all of our evolutionary traits were developed. So in our subconscious mind, you know, this is where we get our fight or flight response. This is this, this is that. So just understand our tonality and our body language, okay, are key indicators to our subconscious mind about fight or flight, about if I trust someone or if I'm, you know, nervous around them, if I don't trust them. And then the last is language patterns. Now, language pattern is just the words we say and how we say them. So how we construct our conversation, how we structure our sentences, the words we use. Okay, do we talk in a way that is confusing, that is backwards? Or do we talk concisely? Can we convey our message so that it is understood by a potential buyer? Okay, so our language patterns do give away a lot of our internal narrative. So our conscious mind understands the words we're saying. Our subconscious mind understands body language, tonality, and the language patterns. So how someone says something is more important or just as important as the words that they say. Because how someone communicates tells us a lot about who they are, their internal state of mind. So are they happy? Are they you know, what's their emotional state? Are they looking to help me? Are they looking to manipulate me? Are they looking to fuck me over? Like all these different things. Our subconscious mind, this is what it is looking at. Identifying friend or foe. Is this someone that I have to watch my back from? Is this someone that's going to murder me in my sleep if I fall asleep around them? Or are they going to steal everything that I have? Like, who knows? So the language, the way we speak, the words we use and how we construct our sentences will tell more to other people than the exact words we're saying because there is additional meaning in how we structure our conversation to the intention that we have. If I always refer to myself when we're communicating before considering you. So for example, we're talking and I said, I feel hungry. I think I might go, go down to the shops and get some food. I might go get some lunch. And you're sitting there and you're like, okay, great. 
thanks for inviting me. Thanks for considering me. Thanks for thinking about me. Because like how we how we think about other people, how we communicate, okay? So if I'm communicating only ever about what I want, my wants and needs to everyone else, it shows everyone else I'm only concerned about my wants or needs, not their wants or needs. So if I was like, well, you know, I'm starting to feel a bit hungry, thinking about going down to the shops to get some lunch. What do you think? Would you like to come with me? Or should we do something here? Like, that's the difference. We'll either, you know, show our intention that we are actively thinking about someone else and considering someone else, or we show our active intention that I am only thinking and considering me, no one else. So that's an important aspect of it. All right. So building strong relationships with your buyers. Now, it's important to understand, like okay, when we're trying to build strong relationships with our buyers, okay, like it's to remain in their circle of trust. Like, like what is a relationship? People must know us. People must like us. People must trust us. Okay. So when we're trying to build strong relationships with our buyers, the more respect, okay, the more respect we have for them, the more consideration that we have for them, the more our intentions are broadcast clearly that I am looking out for your best interests. Like I am thinking about you before myself. Okay. So how does this transfer in sales? Well, we think about it like this. We want to demonstrate, and this is a funny thing, but it's a tactic many businesses will use in sales interviews when interviewing new salespeople is they'll put a proposition to you. You're in a meeting with a potential new customer and your phone rings. What do you do? Do you answer that phone or do you consider, like, do you stay with the customer? Now, it's sort of like a trick question because if you answer the phone, you're, you're showing the customer you're currently with that you're trying to build a relationship with that, you know, oh, give me five minutes. I've just got to take this call. This call is more important to what I'm talking to you about. Okay. Or we say, oh, I'll call them back later. I'm here with you. So, so we either value the customer that we, we are looking to get or we value the customer that we already have. Now, it's a trick question because there is no right response. But the right way to deal with it is to show that customer, the potential customer, hey, when you become a customer of mine, I value your time. So when you reach out to me, I will stop what I'm doing and help you out. But we also don't want to disrespect the new customer to making them feel like we care more about this other customer than them. So it's a process of demonstrating to the bot, the potential buyer that, hey, when you do business with me, like this relationship to me is important. So if I'm with someone else, I'll, I'll politely tell them like, hey, I just have to take five minutes to just see what's happening with this, you know, with the caster of mine, but I'm going to be right back. Now, uh, an important thing to understand is to explain to them, look, when you become a customer of mine, and even if I'm out talking and in a deal, like I'm going to take five minutes out of that deal to to listen to you, to to value you. So that's just the thing. It's just transferring that value. Getting a customer, like when we're building strong relationships, is getting the buyer to understand, I value you. Okay? I value your opinion. I value this, I value that. Now, the way we do that is through respect. So by showing a potential customer, hey, when you do business with me, like I show you the respect of answering the phone for you to find out your problems, okay? So it's just 
how we communicate with them and the intention. All righty, so then we're on to sales cycles. Well, what is a sales cycle? A sales cycle is just the start to the finish of the sale. So it's the process, all the touch points, the objections that we have to do in each of the stages. So we do our marketing. We get interests and leads from our marketing. Okay, we call to qualify those leads to know if they're real people, if they're interested in our product, you know, the next stage. So it's all the segment and stages of the sale. So it's essentially just a visual representation of someone clicks on an ad, we call them, okay, we set up a meeting, okay, we present the product or the service, we close the deal, we onboard them to be a new consumer or a new customer, okay? And then they become one of our clients or our customers, okay? So it's all about mapping in each of those stages, what are the actions I need to take? Well, to get someone to click on an ad, I've got to post an ad. All right, great. To qualify a buyer, well, I've got to reach out to them and talk to them and have a qualifying conversation. To get them to answer the phone, maybe I need to text them, tell them who I am. Like it's all these different little steps. So our sales cycle is just a visual representation of how like the path to success for the buyer. So by really diving in and understanding your sales cycle and, and visually mapping it, we're able to see the path that all of our ideal customers, the ones who clicked on the ad and bought the product and got the benefits of the product, Okay, the, the route that they traveled to get to that goal. And then we just take every other customer down that route. All right, so it's important when mapping out the sales cycle, okay, what we want to do is we just want to map out the objectives of each stage. So, you know, in advertising and marketing, I want when I'm advertising, the objective is to get people to click on the ads. Well, what needs to happen for them to click on the ads? Okay, in the qualifying, we've got a new lead in. I want to call and qualify them. That's the objection. How do I increase the amount of people that I connect to? What are the actions that I can take? Do you see? So by adding in maybe a text message, maybe an email, by calling at specific times, by this, by that, like there are many different things. So when we're mapping out our cycle, our sales cycle, we're just looking to see what are all the different touch points that I can do that either increase or decrease the succession, the success of the stage. But how do we keep a customer moving down the line to the end sale? All right, now, optimizing your sales cycle. All right, so an important thing to understand about this when we're optimizing is we're having a visual representation and we're looking at how we can condense time frames, but how we can also expand services. So for example, lead come lead clicks on the ad, okay? Customer clicks on the ad becomes a lead. Text and the email goes out to them and we call them within 24 hours. So rather than us calling them in a day or two or a week, we call them within 24 hours, within 12 hours, within eight hours. And that's a way that we can collapse that down because we're able to get in contact with people quicker. So the, the stage or the length or duration that they have to sit in that stage is gone from, you know, maybe a week or two down to eight to 12 hours or something like that. And we go through all of the process and we're able to see, well, where are the customers sort of, where are the bottlenecks in the process where I can optimize, where are all the customers getting stuck? And what can I do about that? Maybe we're getting, we got a bottleneck at the end of the sale where we don't have enough documentation from a customer that really holds up the sale. So maybe we introduce in the first steps the requirement for those documentation. Do you see? All righty. So that finishes off this episode or this lesson, lesson one.
and we'll get into it. But essentially, this is going this course, this SARS course is a pretty in depth course. It's 28 different sort of not topics, but you know, different segments or different lessons that are really going to dive deep into understanding what we've gone through today. All right. Well, you have an amazing day and I'll talk to you later. Thanks so much. Bye.